Thanks, Paul. I would like to invite Cam and Martin on the stage. So give them a big round of applause because we want to talk about really difficult stuff like hardware startups. And I, to be honest, I'm not in the comf in comfortable situation because I'm also an investor in both startups. So I will try to be uh, in the positive way and s talk about startups. And we want to talk about lights and dark side of running hardware startups. So, guys, can you uh, tell us a little bit briefly your story of your startups? Because we started some time ago. Both of you are trying to beat global hardware startups. So, could you tell us a story? I'm afraid it is actually working. Um, yeah, so we started more than four years ago, actually. That was April 2012. And um, yeah, every year is, um, is a challenge on its own. Um, recently, we were asked a question, what was the most, the most difficult thing in the whole journey? And I keep saying that, you know, the most difficult thing basically happens every year. At the very first stage is getting the team right, then getting the prototype right, then getting the first customers, then getting the production set up. Um, I don't want to say too much right now because I know that Angie has a lot more um, questions to ask, but um, just to, well, for those of you who have never heard of Jiver, you might go just to the jiverbike.com website. I, I'm going to um, introduce the product right now. Yeah, but can you show us a you know, demo of your product? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I said I wouldn't do it, but um, uh, I guess I need to do it. Well, um, in two sentences, well, one sentence actually, it's an electric folding chainless um, and smart bicycle. First thing is it's electric. As you can see, there's, um, there's a button here which basically lets you turn on the electric motor, which means no sweat. Um, you can really ride on it like on, on a scooter. Um, secondly, it folds up to the position you can see right here. I'll show you how to fold it up in a second. Third thing, it's pretty mechanically advanced because we developed a proprietary um, chainless mechanism, which basically means you can still ride it like any other bicycle, but there is no chain, meaning no mud and no grease splashing on your clothes. And the last bit, the electronic bit, is the connection between um, the smartphone and the bike. So there's a Bluetooth module, obviously, that connects with the bike and presents simple information on the screen like travel distance, burnt calories, location on the map, or, or battery level. Do you want me to do the, the demo right now or yeah, sure. later on? OK, fair enough. Probably, I should probably keep it here, so um, I'll be, well, but you can actually, you can say what I'm doing, just, just describe my, um, <laughs> every step of the unfolding of the bike. So actually, Martin's trying to demonstrate how easy it is to use Jive bike, especially that he want to, uh, to say to the, uh, to the, to instead, to using it instead of public transport, so. As you can see, uh, it's quite easy to, to set it up. It should be. <laughs> As you can see, it's not so easy to build a hardware startup. Um, what, I wanted, what I wanted to show in the very beginning is basically what a bicycle looks like when it's unfolded. So you can see it's um, a pretty unusual um, design of the bike. The first thing that I said, electric motor, pretty simple stuff. You just push the throttle on the handlebar and it goes off. So you can use the bike without any, any, any sweat and effort. Um, secondly, there's a chainless drivetrain that I told you about. That's it. That's it right here. So there is still mechanical drivetrain inside of the frame, though you cannot see it, meaning it's maintenance free and it's very clean. Um, the last thing is the folding. As you can see, it folds up. And the, the smart aspect is um, a smartphone app that you can, well, you can plug in the smartphone in the handlebar, and it connects with the bike, um, showing all the information that I told you about. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Camille? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Camille. I'm, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of, of uh, Intel Cleaning. Our first product is Neuron Mask. So we started back in 2012 uh, with all the projects. Um, after a year of development, we started a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, we raised almost half a million dollars. Uh, back then, the project was aimed to um, help you sleep shorter and uh, 
um, this is what it was the main goal, uh, polyphasic sleep. Um, so we raised almost half a million dollars. Um, after the Kickstarter campaign, a lot of um, uh, sleep scientists around the world reached to us and uh, helped us pivot the product. Um, so right now, our product, Neuron, um, is aimed to help you move your body clock in order to uh, sleep better, but another way, not sleep shorter, but um, adjust your sleep to your needs. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to tell you um, about our uh, backstage story, um, how it, how it was, uh, how hard it was to um, make the fully functional product, make the factory ready for the production, and um, and uh, overall, yeah, how how uh, how the journey looks like from the very beginning of the uh, from from the idea of your head uh, to the product in your head. So actually, both of you said that you started your company about four years ago. So what the what are the biggest issue with building hardware startups? Why does it take so long? Well, yeah, I, I, go I, on. I think um, that uh, we, we are not um, anticipating how a how lot of work is in front of us. Um, a lot of us think that if you're doing hardware startup, it's quite similar to software startups. Um, when I was starting uh, four years ago, there were not so many like literature or article about hardware startups. So, uh, if you want to educate yourself, you, you're looking at software startups, uh, mobile apps, and so on. And, and um, you may thought that it's it's so easy that uh, if you go the following steps uh, as a software company, um, you will have uh, a steadily uh, functioning hardware startup. But the problem is that it. It is totally different. Um, you need to have your idea ready uh, before moving to the investor, to, to the sales, and a lot of people make this, mi this mistake that um, starting working on the product without having like the final um, checked vision, without having a uh, vision validated by their customers. Right, so from my perspective, the hardest thing, as I said in the very beginning, um, to me, there is no such thing as the hardest thing in running a hardware startup. Um, every year, as I said, there is a very hard thing that we need to face, um, you know, um, a, a new challenge. At the very beginning for us, when we imagine what we want to create, uh, we want to create um, a vehicle that will have all the benefits of cycling without all the lifestyle compromises that usually cyclists come with. We wanted to design something that will still be a bicycle, but will catch an eye of someone who is not into bikes. Now, how do you do that? Um, that's, that's pretty difficult. So assembling a team of people who think differently was, was the key in the very beginning. Um, what we did is basically we didn't hire anyone from the bicycle industry. So in our company, there is no single bicycle engineer. We got one consultant in the very beginning who got the basics right, the geometry of the bicycle, um, and that was it. We basically made sure that people who don't work in the bicycle industry will not think of the product as if it was a bicycle. Hence, they will, they will try to create something different. We basically focus on the consumer electronics um, industry and automotive. That's what we're trying to create here. Um, second challenge was um, building the first prototype. Um, it may seem very simple, um, but making a thing like this would cost you probably about $150,000. Getting to the stage where we can actually show something that works, okay? Having renderings um, is not enough, obviously. Getting money to build the first prototype without having anything working, actually, um, is, is very difficult. So getting the money to actually build the prototype and building the prototype are, are huge challenges. Then, how do you get customers to actually pay you any money for the product they're gonna receive in two or three years' time? That's a big challenge as well. And then once you have everything sorted, setting up production, that works autonomously, so you don't need to actually be there to make sure that the, the end product you get is, quality, is, is top quality, is, um, is the challenge we're facing right now. So yeah, um, to me, there's no such thing as one single, the hardest thing. There's, there's something very hard you know, happening every year. We just need to face it. But both of you said that it, you know, it takes time to build the prototype. And when you think about time, it's also about money. So is it a big problem to, to raise the money for hardware startup in Poland? Maybe Kamil? Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, hard to raise uh, money for the hardware startup. Um, 
Um, I even think that like half a year ago, a year ago, it was like uh, some kind of trend uh, of building hardware startup, and it was really, really easy to to um, um, raise a fund for uh, for hardware startup. Uh, but the problem is that like um, huge amount of people that is raising uh, money for hardware startup don't know of, of like how many uh, dollars they need to ask, and the problem. Um, comes along if you ask for um, not enough money. Um, so it's not so easy, I mean, it's not so difficult to get small amount of money because you think this is, it will be enough for, for building your product, but uh, during the process, uh, you're figuring out that it's, it's not enough and, and uh, it's become like harder and harder to raise more and more money if you're in the middle of the process and you underestimate to uh, your goals and, and your next steps. Okay, so even if you underestimate your goals and next steps, uh, what is your relationship with, uh, with investors? Because my understanding is that investors should support you somehow, and how does it work with, you know, with investors in Poland? In our case, it, it, it works pretty well. Um, I think it's like um, the process, process of, of learning things from both sides, from, from our side and from the investor side, because if the, in, if the investor didn't um, invest in any hardware startup before, um, they also need to learn how to cooperate with this kind of startup and, and uh, uh, need to learn um, how this process looks like. So um, I think this is the most important. So, um, so you and your investor uh, are learning um, during the process and, and became better and better in this field. So yeah, from my experience, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Martin, what are your experience? Well, you know what my experiences are. Um, That's why I'm asking. <laughs> we, um, well, we, we're, we're happy um, or, or lucky to have investors who actually, although we're sometimes under delivering, understand that and they have patience. And it's very important for, for myself, who I'm a first time founder, I work before in, in different industries and I've never built a hardware startup. So doing this for the first time in your life is, is particularly painful. And um, it's good to have people around who understand that and don't push too hard when you don't need more motivation. You just need time to get things right. So um, good thing about our investors that we have is that I can always count on a thing, well, there's a thing called sounding board. So even, even if there is no such thing as, as a um, good advice to a certain problem or, or um, uh, the investor sometimes doesn't know really how to solve the problem, the good, the good part is that you can call that person um, anytime and use a sounding board. So basically just talk about the problem. And when you talk about the problem, you somehow develop the solution in your mind. Um, and that's what I really, value my investors. Um, as I said, sometimes we underperform and we have some um, internal issues, but as I said in the very beginning, if you get the right investor who understands the process of building a company and understands it's, it's, it's something more than just a nice Gantt chart, you know, and, and hitting all the milestones one after another, and sometimes things go wrong or you run out of cash or your team lacks motivation or anything, shit happens, they understand that and they're there for you. And um, that, that's, that's possibly the best thing that can happen to a startup founder. And what would be your recommendation for, for instance, we have, maybe we have some, do we have anyone who want to run his own hardware startups here in the room? Are there anyone? Come on, we didn't say something, anything wrong, so. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the question is, do you have any recommendation for people who want to start hardware startups? For instance, we at the beginning, they don't, we, uh, for instance, they don't have investors yet. So what should, where should they start, Martin? I would start small. <laughs> that's, that's probably the best advice I ever got. Um, we were very ambitious in the very beginning and we want to create the best product on the market as there. Um, Luckily, we made it to, to, to production. We're setting up serial production right now, but we basically tried to get too many things right in the first go. So, you know, there's a concept that I'm sure all of you know called MVP, minimum viable product, and start something small that actually tests the market so you don't actually fall over while doing this. And that's probably the single most important thing. Um, 
yeah, I can advise right now. Yeah, I think um, the crucial is like understanding um, your, your product and the cost behind your product. So um, like, I think that if you're thinking about like building something, you need to reverse thinking like from the customer's point of view. So you should think about your product from the perspective of, uh, of the customer that is buying your product at the shelf of Best Buy and, and how much um, how, how much does it pay, does they pay for, for your product. So if your product costs like uh, $200 at Best Buy um, shelf, it doesn't mean that you will get like 150 from this transaction. Um, it, usually it means you will get like $25 out of 200. And, and um, for many people, this is a shock because they, they think that if they're going to sell for a certain amount, they're going to get uh, the whole margin out of it. So um, I think one of the most important things in startups and hardware startups is to take a close look at the distribution of margin and, and how much you can get out of the, the single unit. Um, just recently, I, I, I've seen um, a really nice um, like infographic about Nike shoes and, and how much they get from, from the shoes that cost $100 and you're buying it in, in the distributor. So Nike uh, gets $1 out of $100 that you're paying for your shoes. Um, so yeah, using this example, I think you should um, start thinking about your product and, and, and the, the price policy behind it. If I may add something here, we both did Kickstarter, and um, it's a very popular platform these days, Indiegogo and, and many others. I think it's very important to understand, I'm not sure if this is your experience as well, but it's very important to understand that funding a healthy business just on um, pre-orders and pre-selling um, products is very difficult, if not impossible. And I think this is partly where, what, what Kamil was trying to say. Think about raising $1 million on Kickstarter, right? You gotta pay the taxes, finish R&D, pay your people, um, set up the manufacturing side or outsource the manufacturing to someone, build the actual product, ship it to your customer and make profit. That's close to impossible. So what Kamil said actually is, 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 is crucial. It's crucial, understanding the product, understanding all the ingredients of the product and making sure you know how much it actually costs to make each, of the, each part and how much dollars it brings in the end of the day to your pocket, that's, that's crucial. And starting small. <laughs> But from, from other, on the other hand, you, 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 using crowdfunding campaigns, you got some customers at the beginning. I mean, they are not customers, but they want to be your customers. And usually they have to wait. And how does it look? I mean, you know, how your relation with customers looks like when you have one year delay uh, with you know, sending your product? What do they think? And you know, what is your opinion about how you should start uh, I don't know, sending uh, your product? So like from, from my experience, I could say that I couldn't imagine more uh, patient people. Um, like 90% of them like seriously could almost wait forever uh, until you communicate with them well and, and you've, you're fair uh, with your backers. So, so they're really supportive. They understand like almost everything and um, and uh, this is like really crucial people for you. Um, but like you, you need to take a look at the Kickstarter like on, on from, from different angle and you need to understand that this is a debt. It's not a, like an investment, this is a debt that you generate at the very early stage of, of your company. And um, this is like something um, like you're at the desert and somebody's showing you water uh, that is very far away and, and you start running uh, behind it and uh, you're dying um, thirsty at the desert. So um, you need to be very, very careful in taking this money uh, because you're not only taking money, you're also taking uh, responsibility and, and, uh, um, and these people are trusting you and there is a huge pressure uh, not to... Um, um, to, to deliver these people really good and, and, and quality uh, good product. But like as, as long as you fair with these people, they will be really, really supportive to you. I think it's the same story with investors. So I was my, just going to say that. My quite big recommendation is to communicate with customers and also investors pretty well. And Martin? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that to me, 
early stage customers are the same thing as early stage investors. You, you have good investors, you have bad investors, you have good customers, you have bad customers. What I realized, we did a Kickstarter campaign as well for a different reason. We just wanted to really get some free PR around the world and test the market around the world and see what, what happens. Um, and we got some people who are they're wonderful. They're supporting us all the way. Um, when we're not communicating enough with the backers, they actually phone me, they do interviews, they do the job for me, you know, to keep the other backers happy. Um, and what I also realized is that people who actually care about what you do don't moan on the um, Kickstarter forum. So people who are dissatisfied and are not happy with your progress will moan on the forum, but you also get a lot of um, backers sending private messages saying how grateful they are they can be part of the journey. Um, same with, so same with, with investors. So it's, it's very important in the very beginning to find the right customers as well, not only investors. If you can find the right people who will um, help you prove to your investor that there is demand, but there would not be, pardon my French, bitchy when you under deliver, um, that's, that's, yeah, that, that, that's a huge treasure to an early stage company. Okay, so I don't think that we have uh, time for questions, so I would recommend to catch Camille and Martin after the talk. So just to sum it up, maybe Martin, one sentence and Camille, one sentence, advice for future hardware startups. <laughs> Never give up. <laughs> no, that's, 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 a, that's a cliche, that's a cliche. Um, well, it, it maybe not one sentence, but I think that well, I worked in a software company before, so I can compare software to hardware, and I think that hardware is a lot more fun than software. I mean, I look at software, it's kind of like one layer of stuff you need to do. Then you look at the hardware, you've got, well, just look at this bike, mechanics, electronics, stress analysis, then you've got software, then you've got patent law, production, serial production. There's so many issues you need to touch. There are so many issues you need to be expert-ish in. Um, it's just a lot more interesting to me. Um, yeah, so, so my advice is for you is to find um, like a business model inside the hardware that is uh, a software business model because um, you could still have fun from building a hardware, but you could uh, earn money like a software company. And I think this is like a, like a golden growl. If you, if you combine those two, uh, you will win. Okay, thanks guys.